Welcome back. It's still TV3 New Day. Now we're going to be having a conversation about two key sectors uh, in the economy that, of course, drive development in the country, health and, of course, education. But even before I go into that, let me give you a bit of data on the report of trends of poverty and inequality in Ghana as revealed by um, you know, a survey done by the Ghana Statistical Service 2017. It says that a total of 6.8 million people were captured as poor and therefore could not afford to even spend four Ghana cities, 82 pesos per day in 2016 and 2017. It also stated that 2.4 million people were extremely poor. That's about 8.2%. And that putting all the expenditure together, they could not afford to spend two Ghana cities and 69 pesos per day on food. And that's a total of 982 Ghana cities per year. Now, the report, of course, by the GSS also indicated that majority of these people who are described as poor are found in the northern parts of Ghana. And the reason why I'm giving you this statistic is because based on our conversation today, especially about education and health, you'd realize that when you go into these northern regions, you find that a lot of them, unfortunately, lack these basic amenities and unfortunately are almost cut out from, uh, you know, the developmental projects that are made available Yet, a lot of these politicians, when they want power, focus on a lot of these rural communities. And the focus is not only uh, in the northern regions, but across the country as well. But you realize that they focus a lot on the rural communities and try to get as many votes from these people as possible. But once they win and they come into power, they tend to forget about them. And there's very little development that is made available to these communities. And so based on a study, of course, uh, and programs done by TV3 in collaboration with Mission Ghana, we have seen the necessity uh, of talking about some of these projects and, of course, what the political parties ahead of election 2020 intend to do for these people to ensure that there's equality when it comes to education so it fits into the SDGs and also ensure that, um, of course, well, it's mission, pardon me, supported by Star Ghana and, of course, also make sure that we get adequate health um, you know, services here in the country. And to help us with this conversation, we're starting off with the NDC this morning. So we have the Deputy General Secretary uh, of the NDC. He's also, um, you know, the Deputy, uh, pardon me, let me get that right. So he's also uh, the Deputy uh, General Secretary and National Campaign Manager Deputy of the NDC as well. And um, so he joins us this morning. Good morning. Good morning. Dave. I hope you're doing well. God has been good to us. Okay, so first of all, what I want to find out is the fact that, of course, the NDC is yet to launch its manifesto, but there have been a few of them that have been dropped out there in public for us to get an understanding of what exactly it is that you're working on. You earlier uh, mentioned as a party that you were also taking in some suggestions from uh, people who live in Ghana, of course, on the things that they need. How did that go? Well, thank you very much, uh, Bella, for having me. Um, you would recall that in 2019, we set up our manifesto committee, of mm. which I was a member, and uh, we set out to develop what we call the People's Manifesto. Yeah. Now, yeah. what we sought to do with the People's Manifesto was to generate uh, something that will reflect the views, the ideals, and the expectations of the people themselves. Mm -hmm. So in this mm -hmm. case, giving them the power to determine what they want their future to be or what they, what kind of Madagana they want for themselves. And uh, Bella, um, it's been very interesting from the day we did the announcement that people could bring in, you know, a, a memorandum, mm -hmm. you know, uh, mm -hmm. in respect of what they expect in our manifesto. It will amaze you the kind of inputs that we got from the people. Our yeah. email yeah. that uh, we announced, we got close to um, 3,000, you know, uh, email uh, from very, very, you know, variable sources, um, people making all forms of suggestions. We also requested that people could come with hard copies uh, to the, the office of the general secretary, and we didn't receive less than um, uh, uh, about 800 uh, uh, inputs uh, from people. Then okay. we had the flag bearer also embark on the speak out tour uh, across the country. And there are also very variable ideas from the people. Um, the manifesto that we are bringing out um, uh, for the 2020 elections mm -hmm. may come up mm -hmm. as uh, one of uh, 
the most uh, widely consulted documents in the history of this country when it comes to party politicking and manifestos, uh, because the consultation was very wide. We engaged okay. almost all identifiable groups uh, in the country, and they also made their inputs. So we are coming up with what one may describe as a watertight people's manifesto, okay. which, which, which we believe would be acceptable by the people themselves since they made those even though I know you will not reveal much of the manifesto before it is launched, what were some of the key concerns with regards to education? Well, um, top most on the on the on the issues were the the ills of the free SHS and the challenges that uh, it, that is confronting the secondary education as a result of the the poor implementation of the free SHS program. Mm. And um, you may be you may be aware that we started the free SHS program with the day students and yeah. we're progressing mm -hmm. slowly so that we could do a universal free senior high school education. I mean, we couldn't get the opportunity after 2016 to continue. But what the MPP came to do, obviously, was not uh, uh, what the people was, were expected. So if you look at the Afrobarometer uh, 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 survey, for example, uh, the kind of views that people uh, were expressing mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. the free SHS and the double track system, and all that that came up very you know uh, topmost on the agenda people were expectant that we would deal with you know the issue of uh, accessibility availability of the quality educational you know facilities uh, frontally so yeah. that we can mm -hmm. we can we can solve some of these uh, challenges that the double track system you know has brought so but by your party the, has uh, made uh, some inconsistent remarks okay main concern is what infrastructure is that why the exactly. party says that if it should come to power, uh, come, of course, election 2020, then they are going to, or you are going to scrap the double track system? Is it based on, uh, you know, inadequate infrastructure? Certainly, um, lack of preparation and um, uh, lack of commitment to expanding infrastructure and looking more at the, the innocuous uh, issues of uh, policy in education is what has led to this uh, double track challenges. So... Um, we have made very strong commitment, as you have heard our flavora mention, that we would face out the double track system immediately we are sworn into office. And we have a clear program to expand speedily you okay. know, uh, infrastructure in such a way that we can eliminate it without creating any uh, attendant problems. Okay, but, well, well, we'll wait for those details. But the concern has been the fact that, of course, a, a lot of these parties will come into power or will come up with their promises and say that when we come into power, we don't agree with this, and so we're going to scrap it and do that. Don't you think that we should have had a national plan that makes it easier, um, you know, for a lot of legislation to take place before some of these changes are made? Because, mind you, we're concerned about the people in general and the fact that if a majority of people are saying that they are enjoying free SHS and we're going to scrap the double track uh, policy, how soon are we going to ensure that we will get every student to gain access to education without causing any havoc? Well, um, speaking about a national plan, I think that um, you would agree with me that the NDC over the years have pursued the agenda of having a national plan. And even before we left power, we were working uh, feverishly towards building a comprehensive, sustainable national plan. Mm. And I think that uh, for what the President of the government has done in the past three and a half years, it is even more imperative that the nation pursues a national plan, a national plan that would be grounded in the directive principles of state policy, which will enjoin every government to you know, proceed or continue with very important critical projects that uh, identified in the national plan so that governments do not come and they, they, they abandon uh, uh, projects started by the previous government. A typical example is the case uh, of the E blocks. Mm. We started about 123, we finished about 46, 47. And, and, and since we left office, all the rest have been abandoned. I mean, um, the contractors are not being paid. Um, mm -hmm. Those, of, those who, who, who continue to work uh, and, and have added a few. Uh, uh, 30 or 35 uh, uh, additional uh, uh, e-blocks, you know, have not been paid and the rest have left the, the project in the bush. And that tells you that there is a need for some form of a system, a law that would enjoy, mm -hmm. you know, uh, mm -hmm. by all means, you know, governments to proceed with, you know, projects started by previous governments. 
Okay, away from that as well, a study was conducted by the CDD and they touched on entitlement to free SHS. And I'll just read a bit of it for you. It says here that beyond providing greater security and certainty, statutory protection will enable the operational and administrative aspects and other details of the benefit to be more carefully and transparently set out in appropriate legislative instruments and ensure that any policy change to the program or benefits is legislatively debated and approved. And so back to my previous question about the fact that it seems as if when a party wants to come into power, they look at some of the policies that have been implemented by the party in power and say, well, we're going to scrap this and that. If you're going to scrap it, don't you think that would have been right that it is debated and approved by the key stakeholders? Because have you had time to consult a lot of these key stakeholders to understand what can be done aside abolition or facing out the double track system? Well, I mean, on a generalized note, um, uh, I think that any, any, any policy that will seek to scrap um, uh, any program of a previous government, I mean, should be well uh, accepted by the people. It should, it should be well debated. So it is not out of place for CDD to, 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 to make those suggestions. But this is a study they conducted. And so, of course, they're concerned, especially about the rural folks and the fact that they are the beck and call of political parties. And so this one comes and says, I'm changing this. Then the next one comes and says, okay, we're replacing it with this. So there's no consistency. And that affects the greater mass. I agree with you 100%. And uh, uh, that is exactly the point I'm making, that there is a need for us to have a stronger you know, a, a, a legislative regime or a law that will enjoin or, or as it were, uh, prevent governments from, you know, uh, effecting such changes to uh, major policies. Because as a policy aspect myself, when you put uh, in any measures to uh, uh, implement a program, you know, there, there is a lag period where you don't really feel or see the impact of the program. It takes a particular pe uh, a period for the program to mature, reflect so that you can get the full implications of the program. Mm. Most of the programs that we have abandoned midstream will not leave their lifespan to, to, to see how the, the, the implications or the outcomes uh, would be. So uh, I think that it's, it's, a, it's a fair call. It's a fair call. But the, the case of the double track system is, is completely different. And if for nothing at all, in recent times, as they write the SSC, we have seen the, the, the full outcome of, 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 of the, the debilitating effects that the, 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 the double track system has brought on the educational system. They didn't have enough time to study. Um, they are ill prepared. Government will have to, have to buy, you know, pass questions for them to study and so on and so forth. They are getting disappointed because the past questions are not coming. Now, government is forced to find surreptitious means to you know, uh, uh, get the students comfortable by, you know, uh, uh, getting the examination leakages here and there and so on and so forth. I think that that undermines the fundamental pillars of our education and it it, it, it destroys the, the, the human resource that we so much yeah, mm. uh, uh, to, to, to build for the future. Indeed, we are spending several billions of Ghana City to, to build this human resource. And mm -hmm. if this is the kind of uh, graduates that we are churning from the senior high school where they would have to study past questions to pass. And if the past questions do not come, they get very angry. And sometimes we have to give them big papers to get them to pass as a, Then I think it's a big problem for us as a country. The future looks very bleak mm. for our young people. Well, well issue of past questions, I, I wish we had time to even touch on it further because it's existed for a very long time. I don't think that this would be the first time that students have had to rely on past questions uh, as they prepare for exams. But let's talk about TVET because I know that's also uh, very dear to the NDC. Uh, saying that they are going to ensure that there's free TVET education at the secondary and tertiary levels as well. The MPP says that, well, uh, they've already made TVET free to a large extent at the secondary school level. And so if the NDC is coming in to say that we're going to make it even free at the tertiary level, again, a study conducted by the CDD indicates that TVET receives less than 5% of overall educational expenditure. How is the NDC going to go about this? And, of course, where would funding come from? Do you have a plan for that? Well, uh, we have a, a comprehensive plan for TVET education, and I'm sure, as you may be aware, if you have uh, uh, followed the issues when we're in government, we embarked on a major uh, a program to expand infrastructure in all the uh, TVET institutions uh, uh -huh. around the country, and uh, actually established a few uh, additional uh, TVET institutions. And we believe that if this country 
is going to accelerate in terms of our uh, economic prospects. There is a need for us to grow the, the technical, vocational, you know, uh, subsectors of, of the education. Because then you are able to uh, generate middle uh, level uh, manpower to, to help, you know, accelerate the kind of growth that you want to achieve. So what we have done and President Mahama has announced, for example, is that we are going to embark on a universally free, you know, uh, uh, Tibet education across the country so that majority of the people who are not able, you know, to have access to uh, formal secondary education, you know, can, can, can go into the Tibet. In actual fact, what we want to do is to build a Tibet educational system, which will make it attractive for people to, you know, take it as a choice not as a, you know, a, an option after failing to have access to senior high school or any other institution. And you can see how we, we, we exemplify that by, you know, uh, converting all polytechnics into technical universities and the kind of improvement program that we put in place to expand the, the training infrastructure in, in, in this uh, uh, technical universities. We hope to continue to expand those uh, te technical and training infrastructure in those technical universities mm. when we come back to mm. power. So that those, the, 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 those who come out of the Tibet institutions uh, will not have to truncate their training at the level of, you know, having uh, minimum skills uh, in, in their field of endeavor, but also pursue higher education in technical education. We believe that if we are able to do that, then we would have provided the solid foundation and our solid uh, 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 takeoff speed for, for the acceleration of economic growth. Okay. We think that uh, it's very, very important that we, we look at Tibet. Now, with the claim that they have made Tibet ostensibly free, they have not done that. I mean, that is absolutely not the case. That is not true at all. And that is why um, uh, the people of this country, when they, we, we went on the speak out session and we asked them to bring memoranda for uh, our manifesto, most of them were talking about technical, free technical, you know, education. And I'm sure it is going to have a very good showing in our manifesto mm. when it is uh, Okay. What's your biggest mm -hmm. concern mm -hmm. about health as well as a party? I know you've been very critical of the party in power with regards to infrastructure uh, in the health sector. Is that your biggest concern? In fact, the, the foundation for every economic growth is the, the health of the people. You cannot have a developed economy without, you know, a strong and healthy people. As the, the, the Latinos who say, mensana in sana, a sound mind lies in a sound body. So health becomes foundational when you want to pursue any uh, um, economic uh, growth activity. And that is why we have said that uh, there was a need for us to look at the, the, the health sector in, in various respects, in terms of affordability, in terms of accessibility, in terms of utilization, in terms of uh, uh, quality, and so on and so forth. So you realize that when we were in government, we did an amazing work in terms of health. We built so many polyclinics, about 22 polyclinics. We, we, we built about 1,600 chips compounds. We built close to uh, uh, 13 uh, uh, district hospitals. I mean, they were actually completed, but they were more than 13. There were about 35 of them that we started, some of which the MPP have abandoned and some of which they have they have uh, sort of tissuously arrogated to themselves as their projects, which is, <clears throat> which is not the case. And I'm sure you have followed how they've been exposed badly by our communication team. But they said you only put up an edifice. It was not operational uh, in most cases. It was only an edifice that was put up, and they had to come in to do the operations to ensure that it runs. But anyway, even before you respond to that, let me just uh, get our viewers to take a look at this particular story. Contractors working on the 120-bed capacity Kumewu District Hospital have been asked to provide documents for the contract to be reactivated in order to complete the facility. The district hospital, which was initiated by the SWAL NDC administration in 2012, has stalled since 2017.
Kumewu District Hospital was one of six proposed district hospitals captured in a $175 million loan agreement to be located in Kumewu and Fomena in the Ashanti region, Sekendi in the Western region, Abetifi in the Eastern region, Dodwa in the Greater Accra region, and Tempani in the Upper East region. The district hospital consists of a theater, recovery unit, 24-bed surgical female and male ward, 24-bed female and male medical ward, and a six-bed accident and emergency ward. Since 2017, work on the district hospital has stalled. October 16, 2016, the contractors packed out of sight. At that time, I was a presiding member. Uh, we asked why, and then the reason was the letter of credit has expired, and that uh, <coughs> the then government should have shown commitment. And then we did not also respect the tax waivers that we were supposed to grant them. Residents want the hospital completed to prevent the facility from going waste. We want government to speedily complete the abandoned project. Hospital The project has been abandoned and cannot serve the old needs of residents. And they say there, you be nyanka, money akufa do mon kasa. Nanka o me complete, my office o me complete, e be boy pa. The district chief executive of Setra Kumewu said an audit into the district hospital project revealed some financial discrepancies and structural defects. 29.6 out of the 175 million dollars of which 138 million dollars was released to government of Ghana. That our portion which is 29.6 million dollars um it's finished, but the project is 53%. And um, the structural audit was also conducted by Ministry of Health, Architectural Department, and then the NMS themselves. They raised certain issues, which I think is of major concern as a country, that even the wiring, the out of the 53%, the wiring was suspect. The drains, underground drains, was also substandard or was not done properly. So clearly, the government of Ghana had a lot of issues to resolve. Work on the project, according to the DCE, will resume soon. I had a correspondent from the Minister of Health telling me that um, what they are waiting for is the contractor, uh, they have sent the addendum and then the BOQ to the contractor for them to reactivate the contract, come and then complete the project. The completion of the project will provide access to quality health care to thousands of residents in the district and its environs. And that was the DC of the Kumewu district, Samuel Osei Ajekum, of course, making uh, leveling some accusations against uh, the NDC about why the MPP has not been able to complete the Kumewu district hospital. Peter, what do you have to say about this particular report, of course, um, done by the news team here at TV3? Well, um, Bella, it's marks of stark uh, mediocrity for anybody to suggest that a project that has been abandoned for almost four years uh, 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 would, would be because somebody, you know, uh, uh, has spent some money and they have not, you know, uh, progressed as they, they, they are supposed to progress. I do not see the head and tail of the excuse that the DC was trying to, to, to put out. There is a project, funding has been secured, there is counter, you know, uh, uh, funding by, by, by the government of Ghana. If the funds are still available for the major part, which is about $138 million, uh, why won't you continue, if $138 million Ghana said, why won't you continue? Because with, with, he with said the they did an what's, audit. What's, what, what, I mean, the audit, does it take four years to do an audit? He says the money was finished. This, and I that's why they could not problem. continue, because the money had been spent or wasted by the party in power then, which was the NDC. I, I think this is palpable falsehood because you, you you must bear in mind that this project was not an isolated project. It came with several other projects that you know have been completed. I'm sure you know about the Dudua District Hospital. You know about Formina. Formina is still left there. So what is happening to Formina is that one to you know facing the same challenges of money finished. The Abitifi one, the Garu Timpani one, the 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 Secondi one. All those projects you know, uh, came under the same funding and the same facility. So that excuse cannot be enough 
it cannot be enough to justify the reckless abandonment of, of, of all these you know, hospital projects. What about and saying that the certificates this, this of credit had also expired and that's why they could not carry on with the project? Yes, but when you come and you abandon the project and you leave it for four years, the credit will expire because contractors were on site and they were constructing you know, uh, the facilities and you came to stop them. And so many other projects uh, under the, 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 the President Mahama uh, administration has been left to rot and most of them are facing similar challenges. Is it because the, the money is, again the, was the squandered is, for all the projects? Maybe that's why they could not continue? Bella, can you come again, please? I'm saying that is it because maybe the money for all the projects had been squandered and that's why they could not continue? No, that, that cannot be the case. I mean, it can absolutely not be the case. You know, the running government projects is not like going to buy uh, 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 tomatoes and pepper on the market where you just go and they carry the money and you give it to somebody to go and buy. No, you, you, you start the project in phases. So you go to site, you raise mobilization, you raise certificates, they come and assess what you have done and they pay accordingly in that order until you finish the project. So it is not like running an up and pump store where somebody can just come and, you know, uh, just put some money and, 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 and buy something and go. So anybody who says that perhaps uh, uh, does not understand how these uh, projects work and may, may perhaps uh, be engaged in, in, in an exercise of uh, 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 mischief. So let's, let's, let's put that aside. But essentially the point that must be made is that this government, four years, have not built a single district hospital. They say they've built they polyclinics. Built a single regional hospital. They have not built a single teaching hospital. They, they have say not they built have polyclinics. A single institutional hospital. And the polyclinics and could serve the same system. purpose as the district hospital or even more. And this is according to the Deputy Health Minister, Dr. Okoboy. No, I mean, Dr. Okoboy is completely confused. Uh, I, I, I heard him uh, speak about this yesterday, and I couldn't believe that a medical doctor of his teacher and a deputy minister of health would uh, exhibit that level of uh, ignorance about, you know, uh, how uh, hospitals or medical centers are classified. Let me give you a, a, a quick preview of the uh, Ministry of Health's own, you know, uh, classification of uh, medical facilities. They have indicated that clinics covers uh, an approximate area size of about 160 meters square uh, to 240 meters square. So when you have uh, any medical facility that uh, falls within this range of 160 meters square and 240 meters square, it's classified as a clinic. Now, if you want to look at health center, mm. it covers an area of 150 meters square to 600 uh, meters square. Then uh, if you look at polyclinics, polyclinics have also been classified differently as covering areas between uh, 2,500 meters square to 3,600 meters square. And district hospitals have also been classified uh, uh, differently as uh, having to cover uh, an area of uh, 4,600 meters square to 6,500 meters square. So this is the Ministry of Health's own classification of medical facility so it beats my imagination and uh, uh, it, it begs it begs for uh, 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 several answers uh, that the deputy minister of education would make that assertion so i think the the the, the, the fact about it uh, cannot be delivered we should uh, mm. just put it right that uh, he he basically lied or he spoke out of ignorance okay but clearly that means that if the ndc should come back into power then of course they will be completing some of these abundant projects uh, that they have accused the N NPP, um, you know, of. And at the same time, it also brings us back to the issue of having a national plan because then we won't have to be having a debate about who has built what at a point, especially when we still have abundant projects that have not been completed. Moving forward, what's the plan of the NDC if they should come to power? How do we intend to fund the completion of some of these projects? If, according to the DCE, some of these projects, of course, have had all the funds squandered or at least a major part of it squandered, how do we fund the completion? Bella, that wouldn't be a very difficult job at all. In fact, if you heard President Mahama last Sunday, he made an emphatic statement that in our first year in government, we are not going to start any major new uh, uh, infrastructure project in uh, both health and educational sector. We are going to commit to completing uh, most of the, uh, the existing or the uncompleted or abandoned projects that uh, we left. Then we would uh, embark on an accelerated infrastructure drive uh, with a big push 
uh, in, 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 in that period till uh, we leave office. And he has made that uh, emphatic statement about the big push infrastructure, you know, uh, drive that we have put in place. But let's 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 be clear on this. Um, the record of President Tekufuado, both in education and in health, it's it's it's, it's very embarrassing compared to the thorough records of, of President mm. Mahama. And mm. I have made mention of a few of the health infrastructure uh, that we put in place compared to the bigger ones that Dr. Baumia was touting uh, some few days ago. Okay. He, for example, mm -hmm. said that they, they, they have done major, you know, uh, uh, infrastructure uh, projects in health and we were waiting to hear them. And he was talking about 243 uh, chips compounds. Whilst we were able to do 1,600 uh, in four years. Mm. And they spoke about four polyclinics. And even that four polyclinics are stolen projects uh, from, from, from the NDC because we started all those uh, uh, projects. In okay. Africa, Peter, the polyclinics your, your time is very limited. Made, you have just about 30 seconds to wrap up, please. Yes. So in, in actual fact, the, the, the polyclinics that they, they, they were talking about um, uh, in Greater Accra, for example, were all government projects that the President Mahama started. The design, the funding and everything was approved in parliament on 2016. So President Ekufuadu invariably has nothing to show at all, even when it comes to uh, polyclinics. Mm. So that tells you the difference. And that is why perhaps they are running away from the infrastructure debate or any debate of that sort. Mm. President Mahama mm. has challenged President Ekufuadu to a debate. And I okay. think perhaps, uh, Bella, all of us must you know, help to uh, uh, advocate for this debate all or right. this all important all right. debate to come on. Even if okay. President Kufa okay. selects his own moderator, we, we, we are ready for, for, for that debate. No problem. Thank you so much for speaking to us this morning. Mr. Peter Buama Otukunu is the Deputy General Secretary of the NDC. He's also uh, the Deputy National Campaign Manager uh, of the NDC as well. We've been touching on some key sectors, education and, of course, health. Now, this is mission and is supported by Star Ghana Foundation with thanks to European Aid and the UK Aid.